tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You are listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about malicious morticians and photographic findings. I'm your host of the evening, Nick Goroff, standing in for our dear friend Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us this evening to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Melissa Talbot and Catherine, our voice talents, Eric Peabody, our beloved creepy face, and me, Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first story tonight is written by Melissa Talbot and performed by yours truly. In it, we'll meet someone who loves his job and takes a lot of pride in his work. Maybe too much pride, actually. Without further ado, I present to you the morgue. The morgue is cold and still in the early morning hours as a cave buried deep in the earth. I begin my daily routine by pulling on my blue scrubs and latex gloves. Even in the dark, my fingers find the light switch immediately. The lights overhead flicker once, then turn on, and the small gray room is illuminated. The stainless steel mortuary table waits for me in the center of the room, disinfected and sparkling under the fluorescent lights. The wall to the left is filled with rows and rows of square boxes where inside awaits my day's work. I open one of the small square doors in the wall and pull out the sliding rack. A new one was brought in late last night. I transport the body to the table in the center of the room and look at the yellow case file awaiting on the nearby table. A middle-aged man was found lying in a puddle of his vomit on Park Street around three o'clock this morning. I know that street well. It's a small side street shoved between the Red Rooster pub and the pharmacy off the main road. In a small town, I know every street as if it was my own. Wakefield was one of the smallest towns in the state, with just over 3,000 people. There was one school for children from the ages of 5 to 18, one church, one barber, one grocery store, and just very recently, a diner. I am the only medical examiner in the town, but in a town this small, one professional was enough. I set the file down and pull my tray of instruments toward me. I pick up the scalpel and hold it between my fingers for a moment. I love the weight of it. Not too heavy, not too light. I set the blade to his chest, 
the sharp tip disappearing in the cloud of dark chest hair. The skin parts with just a slight bit of pressure, leaving a red trail beneath. It smooths through the first few layers of skin, like hot knife and butter, but I need to press harder to get through the muscle now that rigor mortis is set in. Soon the body is split from chest to navel, and I can explore what it has to tell me about what happened. I plunge my fingers into the depths of his chest, feeling the wetness of his organs between my gloved fingers. I find the heart and, with a scalpel, cut it loose from the surrounding tissue. The heart appears normal, with no signs of strain or trauma. I set it in a bowl on the table and probe further. I find the liver and dissect it. It's abnormal, yellow and fatty. It emits a foul smell. I set it in another silver bowl. The clock on the wall ticks away, the sound echoing loudly in the otherwise quiet room. An old radio sits in the corner, but I never use it. I only work in silence. I have always had an unusual fascination with death. I could trace it back to one sunny afternoon in first grade as I walked home from school. On the street side was a black shape I didn't recognize. I stepped closer and peered down to see it was a cat. It had been struck by a car and lay in the street. Its eyes opened slightly. Its mouth parted, showing two bloodied fangs. I picked up a nearby stick and poked the cat with it, sending the flies resting on it flying. The cat didn't move. Unzipping my backpack, I knelt on the sidewalk and shoved the cat inside amongst my binders and workbooks. I walked quickly home, feeling the extra weight of the pack on my shoulders. Once home, I ran to the shed and carefully placed the cat in a cardboard box. For a long while, I stared at it in the dim glow of our darkened shed. The lifeless eyes of the feline stared away at nothing. The body was just an empty vessel now, a cocoon after the butterfly had flown away, left to rot amongst the branches. When my mother came home that evening, I quickly pulled her to the shed to show her the treasure I had found. Her screams of horror echoed throughout the street. I was quickly taken into the bathroom, stripped of my school uniform and shoved in the bathtub, where I was scrubbed head to toe with a rough washcloth, leaving my skin red and inflamed. My father came home from work a short time later, and I heard my mother breathlessly explain what had happened, her voice on the verge of tears. I was listening from my bedroom, where after my bath my mother had put me in fresh pajamas and put me into bed even though it was only six o'clock in the evening. My father came in later and sat at the end of my bed and told me that I wasn't in trouble, but it was very important not to touch things found in the street, especially dead animals. The next morning, the box with the cat was gone from the shed. I never realized what happened to it, never daring to bring it up again. But I suspected my father buried it somewhere in our backyard. I never brought home anything else, but would never forget the cat with its mouth open and a silent cry and its open eyes, which would stare and stare, but see nothing. After college, I attended medical school and then went on to do my residency. My college years were filled with intensive study and training. Most afternoons, I would settle in the library and stay there until long after midnight, poring over medical textbooks until my eyes strained and my neck ached. I learned everything there was to know about the human body, both in life and death. I learned how the body worked like a clock, each part relying on one another, working perfectly in sync. Then the clock would stop ticking and nature would take its course, breaking down the body bit by bit. The earth 
taking back what belonged to it. After my residency, I could have gone anywhere, moved to any city. I graduated top of my class with job offers from all over the country, but I found myself back in Wakefield, settled in a small house half a mile from my childhood home. There I became the first medical examiner in the town, beforehand everyone having to use the services of the next county over. Wickfield was quiet and small, and sometimes I went weeks without examining a body. That is, up until six weeks ago. A knock on the door brings me from my thoughts. I pull a sheet over the body and remove my bloodied gloves. I call for whoever is there to enter. The door opens, and a familiar face appears. Sheriff Peterson removes his hat and shuts the door behind him. Good morning, Martin, he says. Please tell me you have some good news. His eyes looked at the shape beneath the sheet for a long moment before looking back at me. I'm afraid I am ruling the cause of death to be poison, ingested based on the discoloration and size of the liver. Sheriff Peterson let out a long sigh and shuts his eyes. Cyanide? Most likely, but I won't know for sure until I run the tests. He runs his hand through his hair. Even for a man in his sixties, Peterson still has a thick, full head of hair. His bushy mustache is the same salt and pepper tint, and just as full. There's a darkening under his eyes, and his usually clean-shaven face is a five o'clock shadow. Three bodies in six weeks. We can't deny it anymore. Definitely a pattern. He picks up the file on the tray and flips it open. I knew Brian. His eyes look at the shape beneath the sheet again. He was a good man. He had a wife and two sons. I nod. Tell them I'm sorry for their loss. You hear about these things happening, Peterson continues. But not here. Not Wakefield. This is a good town. A community. Is there anything you can tell me about the poison? Anything I can use to trace it back to whoever the killer is? Unfortunately, cyanide is one of the most common poisons, even in households. It's in many pesticides and insecticides and in more natural forms like almonds and apple seeds. Both the pharmacy and the grocery store sell it in various forms. Peterson shakes his head. That's what I was afraid of. He sits on a metal stool in the corner and sighs again. I can't believe this. There hasn't been a murder here in over 35 years. He stares off into the distance as if he is seeing something far beyond the gray walls of the room. I've always been proud to say I'm from Wakefield. Friendly people, great school. Always low death and crime rates, but now this? He shakes his head again. You'll catch the bastard, I tell him, and try to be supportive, but it's difficult. I've never been good at conversation or socializing with others. I am my most comfortable among the dead. It's the living who unnerve me. There's no pattern. The first victim, Cindy Aylman, was found dead on Bakersfield Street six weeks ago. She was only 16, for Christ's sakes. Mr. Cummings stumbled upon her while out with his terrier early in the morning. The second, Vic Charles Little, was found dead in his yard by the paper boy the next morning. Now Brian. He looks again to the figure under the sheet, but he casts his eyes away as if looking for too long would harm him. Each victim was a different age. They had almost nothing in common except they were found with alcohol in their systems and died of cyanide poisoning. None of them were robbed and mutilated. What's his motive? I open my mouth, but find no words. 
I look at the clock on the wall. I wish she would go and leave me to my work. I still needed to finish disemboweling the body and sewing it up before the blood testing. You're going to catch the man who did this, Sheriff, I tell him, not knowing what else to say. Sheriff Peterson nods and stands. You're right, Mort. Thanks. I'm sorry. I know you're busy. Call my office if you need anything else. I nod to him. Yes, Sheriff. Of course. The funeral is tomorrow. Will he be ready for the Undertaker by tonight? I nod. I will do my best. The Sheriff nods in my direction. Thank you, Mort. I remove the sheet from the body once more and put on a new pair of gloves. He sets his hat atop his head once more and makes his way out of the door. I feel a sense of relief when he's gone, when it's just me alone, once again listening to the sound of the ticking echoing around the room. Within the hour, I removed all of the body's organs and placed them in garbage bags. Now it's time to sew up the chest cavity. Unlike some people in my med school class, stitches were never a problem for me. My fingers could work with quick precision, moving the needle through the skin, leaving neat black rows of thread down the body, as perfect as any machine. I look again at the clock on the wall. It's been hours since Sheriff Peterson was here, but it's hard to tell. There are no windows in the morgue. My only link to time outside is the clock which ticks with the same precise movement as my hands working with the needle, in and out, in and out. It's as steady as a pulse or breath, neither of which this body would have again. When I'm done, I trace my finger lightly over the row of stitches I have made feeling the thread against cold skin. I look at the clock on the wall. It's almost time to go home. The days have been going by so much faster than they had been before the killing started. Before then, I would go weeks without seeing a single body. Time mainly spent in the morgue, filing or disinfecting instruments again and again. Occasionally, I would receive a call saying that someone had passed away of old age, but those times were becoming few and far between. With modern-day medicine and surgeries, everyone was living longer. Now, it had been three bodies in six weeks, almost a record for Wakefield, except for the mining accident in 27, where over 50 miners were buried alive after an explosion. But that was decades ago, and Wakefield hasn't been a mining town since 58. I had considered leaving. I had the training and experience to go to a bigger city to find a better job with more work and better pay. Yet no matter what, I couldn't seem to give up Wakefield. It was easy here, where I knew everyone and everyone knew me. There was no issue of meeting new people or finding a new place to live. Wakefield was quiet and small, without the stress of packed city streets or traffic. Things were going to change now, however. People might start to leave town if the killings didn't stop, but somehow I doubt they would. You didn't leave Wakefield, and if you did, you came back. No one could escape this town. Or maybe it was just me. I had left for a few years to get my degrees, but I didn't fit in, like a square peg trying to cram myself into a round hole. I stood stark against the background, never blending in no matter how hard I tried to smudge my edges. So I came back to Wakefield, and it was like pulling on an old pair of tennis shoes. Comfortable, snug, perfect. It wasn't happiness, I wouldn't call it that, but it was right. It was where I needed to be. Happiness was never something I had, but that's okay, because I had no need for it. 
I needed a stable routine. I was most comfortable in the morgue with my disinfected steel tables and my tools lined in perfect rows. I took comfort in the chill of the room and the glare of the fluorescent lights. I didn't need people or companionship. Everything I needed, everything I lived for, was in the morgue. The phone on the back counter rings, and I grit my teeth at the noise, ruining the still silence of the room. I answer it. It's Peterson. He will be here in an hour to collect the body and bring it to the funeral home for tomorrow's procession. I hang up. The body is ready. All I have to do is wait. I remove my lab coat and make my way to the back cabinet. After work, I will probably go to Red Roosters and get a pint. I'm not overly fond of drinking. I do not like my reflexes to be slowed or my mind to be less sharp. But it's a necessity for the night's plans. I open up the cabinet above the counter, pull out the small wooden box from the back, and set it on the counter. I undo the metal latch and open it. Six bottles are lined neatly inside the box. I remove one and, carefully, take off the top. The powder inside shifts gently as I move the bottle between my fingers. I pull out a small white envelope from the nearby drawer, about the size of a quarter. Gently, I shake the powder into the envelope and seal it tightly before slipping the envelope into my pocket for safekeeping. I recork the bottle and set it back in the box with the others before placing it back in the cabinet. I look at the clock. It's almost five. The sheriff will be here soon for the body. I remove my gloves and bouffant and throw them in the garbage before pulling off my scrubs. I pull my coat from the hook before pulling it on. I would never have thought it would come to this, that this would be how I would go about getting material for my job. It wasn't the boredom that drove me to. It wasn't money or the thrill of the hunt. I didn't relish it, not even the small tingle of satisfaction in my stomach when I was able to slip the powder into the girl's drink the first time. I wasn't planning for it to be her specifically, but fate had dropped her into my hands. I had carried around the deadly envelope for weeks, but never had the chance to use it. Then, on my walk home from work late one night after yet another day without a single body to work on, I saw the opportunity present itself. She was walking down the street her dress too short for such a cold night, and her heels causing her knees to twist awkwardly. She held a beer bottle in one hand and her purse in the other. Staggered, the alcohol capsizing on her, hit the hardware store's brick wall and slid down to the sidewalk. She smiled at me when I knelt to her. Didn't see my fingers, always so nimble and fast, dumped the powder into her beer. I handed the bottle to her afterwards, but she was too clumsy to hold it. I held it to her mouth as she gulped it down. Her eyes, green and coated in dark makeup, were half closed as she leaned against the wall. She thanked me, her words slurring heavily. Little did she know we would be meeting the next morning again when I would find her on my slab, an empty cocoon to be cracked open. I relished her autopsy like none before. I'd earned it. I waited a few weeks before trying again. The winter cold was fading, and more and more people attended Red Roosters to sit outside on the wooden picnic tables, smoking cheap cigarettes and laughing at the same old stories. In the chaos in the bar, no one noticed me there among the crowd, dumping in the cyanide as I reached for my own drink. I didn't know who the drink belonged to, but it didn't matter. I drank my beer quickly and left as soon as my glass was empty. The next morning, I found Charles Liedel waiting for me in the wall. 
tomorrow there will be another one. I don't know who, but it doesn't matter. As long as it's someone, all that mattered. I needed to cut, carve, and disembowel. I needed the dead the way others needed the living. And if Wakefield would not give it to me, I would take it myself. There's a knock on the door, and Peterson pokes his head in. Hi, Mort. We're ready to take him. The hearse is out back. I nod. He's all ready for you. The sheriff sighs deeply and looks over at the body on the slab. Don't worry, Brian, he says to the body. We're going to catch whoever this sick bastard is. We're going to do whatever it takes. Right, Mort? He looks at me. And I smile. Whatever it takes. I hope you enjoyed The Morgue, as written by Melissa Talbot and voiced by me, your host, Nick Goroff. As a new addition to the Chilling Tales family, I am, as a reader, really thrilled at the idea of seeing what Melissa will bring us next, what sort of twists and turns we can expect, let us know down in the comments below if you feel the same. As for me, well of course you can find me throughout social media and even here on YouTube at Wizard of Cause, but I'm proud to actually announce the launch of a new channel. In honor of the epic legend that is Kurt Vonnegut, this new channel has been titled 2BR02B, or as it's meant to be said, 2BR not to be. This channel will focus on speculative science fiction and dives into more conceptual territory. If you enjoy sci-fi and speculative fiction of this sort, come by and give me a look. And naturally, as we both know what a fan of horror you are, well, you should know you were in exactly the right spot. So, strap in, and let's continue our journey into the dark together. Our second tale of the evening is written by Katarib and performed by Creepy Face and Eric Peabody. In it, we will meet two friends enjoying a hike, one that becomes haunted by a series of mysterious photos that seem to depict a pair of hikers getting lost in the woods, as well as a mysterious house stumbled upon that's hidden deep within the trees. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Photos in the Woods. For as long as I have known him, Jake has been obsessed with hiking. Personally, I have trouble understanding the appeal of being out in the woods. Don't get me wrong, I'm not some sunlight-hating shut-in who loathes the outdoors, but being out in the middle of nowhere fills my mind with images of all the things that could go wrong. That's actually why I first agreed to go with him. I didn't want to be sitting at home wondering if he was lost and alone out in the woods somewhere. I will admit that our hikes are pretty enjoyable, but it's mainly because Jake is a great person to be around. Once we are out on the trail, he has a way of making me forget all about my anxiety. He points out the various species of birds, tells me the cheesiest nature puns, and somehow he always finds the best spots to take a moment and appreciate our surroundings. Honestly, I'm not sure why he never became some nature guide. He'd be brilliant at it. I should never have agreed to go on our last hike, but as they say, hindsight is 2020. Jake called me up late one Friday night, very drunk going on and on about some trail he heard about from a guy at a bar. This guy claimed he knew about a great trail that wasn't well known, but had some stunning scenery. They'd been chatting, and Jake inevitably brought up his favorite topic, hiking. It didn't matter if he was completely plastered, hiking was always on Jake's mind. He wrote down directions on a napkin, and Jake wanted to know if I was down to check it out in the morning. I knew Jake would be hung over, and I would have to do all the driving, but there was no way I could let him go on his own. The sensible thing would have been to talk him out of going and put it off for another day, 
But once Jake gets excited about something, it's no use arguing with him. I told him to count me in. We'd pulled into an empty parking lot around 10 the next morning. We'd normally be on the trail by then. But the strange glyphs crudely scrawled out on a beer-stained napkin weren't the easiest to follow. So we didn't quite make it there as early as planned. The lot only had two spots, so I took a left and hopped out of the car. My prediction about Jake's hangover was spot on. And the car ride hadn't helped him. He stumbled out of the car and onto his hands and knees. I turned away as I knew what was coming. When I looked back over at Jake, he was staring very intently at something. What is that? He held something out to me. I found it on the ground. It was a dirty Polaroid picture that looked like it had been lying on the ground for quite a while. Showed two girls standing at the mouth of the trail, smiling at the camera. The one on the left had blonde hair tied back with a bandana and was wearing a red tank top, while the other girl was a redhead wearing a light blue t-shirt with her arms stretched out toward the camera. I handed the photo back to Jake. I guess they must have hiked the trail and dropped this. It had to have been ages ago though, I mean, who even takes Polaroids anymore? Jake stared at the photo for another moment before sticking it in his pack, and we got ready to head out. At first there wasn't much of note about the hike. The trail was a bit overgrown, but otherwise similar to most of the others we had traveled. We'd been going for about 30 minutes when we came upon some rocks perfectly shaped for sitting. Jake objected to taking a break so soon, especially after our late start, but he was still nursing his hangover and I wanted to get some water in him. He took a few swigs from his canteen and handed them to me. As I took them from him, I noticed something under his foot and leaned over to yank it free. It was another Polaroid. This time the photo was taken from behind a person who looked to be the red-haired girl from the first photo. She was walking up the trail. I was pretty sure I could make out the very rocks we were resting on up ahead. She was in the first photo, too. Jake was leaning toward me, peering down at the photo. Why did they leave this behind? Strangely, these photos were just left lying around. It did seem strange, but I figured it was only two photos. Anyone could have lost one or two out of their bag. Jake stuck the Polaroid with the first one, as we kept moving. We made our way further down the trail and I found myself wondering why exactly the guy Jake met at the bar had been so into this place. It was pretty unremarkable, other than a feeling of unease that I couldn't seem to shake. It almost felt like I'd walked this trail before, even though I was sure I'd never been here before. Jake was in front of me, only half paying attention to the trail, flipping through some notebook. I wondered aloud, mostly to break the silence. What exactly did that bar guy think was so great about this place? The question went unanswered. Jake was completely fixated on his notebook. A bit further down the trail, we took another short break as Jake read his book. I took a moment to survey the surrounding trees. I'd begin to zone out when my gaze landed on a large rock a good ways off the trail. I almost missed them at first, but... That there were two figures huddled close together at the base of the rock. My eyes focused on them, and I was sure it was the two girls from the photos. They looked terrified and had their arms wrapped around each other as they frantically looked around them. Suddenly, Jake placed a hand on my shoulder and I just about shit myself. Let's keep moving. Sorry for making you wait. I nodded at him and looked back at the rock. But nothing was there. Jake's notebook was gone, but the silence still hung around. Nothing had happened, but a sullen atmosphere had built up around us. It must have been getting to Jake, too, because he spoke up. Holding on to those below, new things help with letting go. What? I gave him a questioning look. He had caught me off guard, and I wasn't sure what he was saying. The guy, the one who told me about this place, that's what he said. Holding on to those below, 
new things help with letting go. Well, that's creepy as fuck. If that made you think coming here was a good idea, you were drunk. Are you sure he isn't out in the woods following us? A feeling of being watched crept over me, and I regretted saying it immediately. Something feels off here. None of the other places we've gone felt like this. It seemed like Jake was going to say more, but at that moment we came upon another Polaroid. This one stapled to a tree. He pulled it down as we both took a look. The blonde from the first photo held a map and pointed off into the woods behind the photographer. There was dirt smeared across her face, and her expression was one of trepidation. She was lost. The first two photos had been innocent enough, but not only was the content of this one worrying on its own, someone had fucking stapled it to a tree. We should call it a day, Jake. You know I hate scary shit, this is fucked up. Plus, she is lost. We need to report this to someone. His eyes were stuck on the photo, and I could tell it was affecting him. Maybe more than it was me. It's probably some prank. We'll look like idiots if we bring this to the cops. Just don't let it get to you, and enjoy the hike. Jake added the photo to the growing collection in his bag and started moving without waiting for a response. There was no way he thought this was just a prank, but he didn't seem to want to talk about it. The feeling of being watched intensified. I thought I had just psyched myself out earlier talking about bar guy following us into the woods, but the feeling had become palpable. It was wrapped around me weighing me down yet pushing me forward as to not be left behind. After the third photo, Jake didn't say anything and paused only a few times to scan the woods around us. I was feeling stressed out and Jake was scaring me. I had never seen him like this before. He claimed it must be some kind of prank, but the photos made him more determined to keep moving. After what felt like hours, he finally stopped. There. He had a finger raised, pointing out between the trees. I followed his finger to see what he was pointing at, and immediately spotted it. I could make out something large and white between the trees, but I wasn't sure exactly what it was. It seemed like bad news, though. I have no idea what that is, but can we get the fuck out of here? Nothing about today has felt right. I swear, I'm not going on any more hikes if we don't turn around right fucking now. The words came out sounding much harsher than I had intended, but the situation was really getting to me. Jake stood there for another moment, probably considering how he would respond before looking at me. I'll turn around and go back with you if you check out whatever that is with me first. Otherwise, I'm going to continue down the trail, with or without you. He was serious and it pissed me off. Really? That's how you're going to play this? God, fuck you, man. Why do you even need to go check it out? You know I'm not going to walk back to the car alone, so this isn't a choice. He didn't back down. Oh, fine. Let's just get this over with. He turned back towards the trees and stepped off the trail. I followed behind him, periodically glancing over my shoulder, trying to pick out landmarks to find the way back later. Jake didn't seem as concerned as he picked up his pace, moving closer to the thing in the woods, which I could now see was an old house. It was run down and looked like no one had occupied it in decades. Definitely the last thing I wanted to be investigating in these woods. Jake stopped at the base of the stairs leading up to the front porch and looked down at something. He'd put a bit of distance between us in his rush to get there. So it was a moment before I caught up and saw he was staring at the back of another picture lying on the first step. He seemed to be afraid of what it might have to show us. I realized I was holding the photo without even knowing I had picked it up. 
The same girls were pictured from the waist up, standing in front of a concrete wall. Their cheeks were streaked with tears. In the space between them, just visible at the bottom of the photo was what looked like a burlap sack. Holy fuck, Jake, look at this. What the hell happened to them? Who took this photo? I realized I had never seen anyone truly scared until I saw that photo. He took a look before responding. They might be in the house. That looks like a basement. We have two, just like they did. I thought I could do it, but I can't ask you to go in. One for one will have to work. He started up the stairs. Jake, wh what do you mean? Do we have two? I don't know what's going on, but we need to get out of here. He ignored me and continued forward. This is what everything has been for. I can't turn around. I'm sorry for lying to you and bringing you into this. I want you to take this, just in case. He pulled out his notebook and tossed it to me, before flashing one last smile and disappearing through the door. He wasn't making sense anymore. I knew I couldn't let him go alone, and I swear I tried to follow him, but my legs just wouldn't move. Instead, I put his notebook in my bag and waited. I stood there for at least 20 minutes. There was no sign of Jake. Not even a sound. The worry for my friend eventually overpowered the fear holding me in place. And I made my way up the stairs and stepped into the house. The moment I crossed the threshold, I could feel the air get heavier and it became difficult to breathe. A long hallway stretched out before me. The floor was dark hard wood. The walls were papered with some swirling purple design I could barely make out through a thick hovering of grime. Cobwebs were strewn across the hallway, and a layer of dust coated the ground. Jake would have headed to the basement looking for those girls, so I took a deep breath and started down the hallway to look for stairs. I moved through the house in my search for any sign of the basement, assuming there was one, avoiding the old furniture that was scattered all around, falling apart and blanketed in filth. Each time I took a step, I heard footsteps matching my own echoing from above. I did my best to ignore it, hoping I would find the stairs down before stumbling upon the stairs up. I had made my way through the parlor and dining room when I came upon the kitchen. A door hung ajar on the opposite wall from where I entered, revealing a dark staircase leading down. I called out, hoping to get an answer from Jake, but the only response was silence. I was left with no choice but to head into the basement. With each step I took toward the door, I could feel my anxiety and fear grow. I envisioned all the horrible scenarios of what was going to happen when I went down those stairs. I made it about halfway through the kitchen, legs wobbling as if they could no longer hold my weight when I heard Jake call my name. He sounded distorted, as if he was screaming through a fan. Hearing his voice got my body moving, and I dashed across the kitchen down the stairs into the basement. I found myself in a big, empty space. The floor and the wall by the stairs were made of concrete, and the only sources of light were a few bulbs hanging from the ceiling, although I wasn't sure how the house had working electricity. One concrete wall may not be easily distinguished from another, but this had to be where the last photo we found had been taken. Even with the lights, it was hard to make out my surroundings, so I was cautious as I began to walk forward. I could barely make out dark spots on the ground and tried not to think about what they were. About a dozen steps away from the stairs, I felt my foot land on something and reached down. Finding a burlap sack... 
As I was inspecting the bag, a flash went off no more than a few feet in front of me. My heart began pounding hard against my chest. I couldn't make out anything in the darkness, but something was there. I moved forward, doing my best to stay quiet and not draw the attention of whatever was in that basement with me. The only thing that kept me moving was the need to find Jake. I could barely make it out, but on the floor in front of me was the white outline of another Polaroid, confirming what the flash had been. I felt tears flowing down my cheeks. I hadn't realized just how terrified I was. It was too dark to see what was in the photo clearly, so I quickly picked it up and headed back toward the stairs. My mind was conjuring up all manner of creatures lurking in the darkness, watching my every move. I made it to the bottom of the staircase before dashing to the kitchen, shutting the door behind me and sinking to the floor. <sighs> After letting everything process for a moment, I looked at the photo. I knew I wouldn't like what I saw, but that photo will forever haunt my nightmares. The scene mirrored the photo we'd found outside the house, except in this one. Wide, unnatural smiles spread across the girls' faces, and their cheeks weren't streaked with tears but with blood that flowed out of the hollow pits where their eyes had been. I glanced at the bottom of the photo, but my brain didn't want to accept what was there. The burlap sack from previously was replaced with the terrified face of Jake, gagged and looking toward the camera. I have a hard time recounting the exact details of how I made it out of those woods, but what I do remember is running, running out of the house, running to the trail, running back to the parking lot. I never knew how long and how hard I could run until pure fear fueled me. My lungs were on the verge of bursting when I reached the car and collapsed into the driver's seat, bawling my eyes out. In the weeks following my return from the woods, I was questioned by the police about Jake's whereabouts. I couldn't include all of the details, but I told them mostly the truth. Jake had gone inside a house in the woods and never come back out. Rescue workers searched for him, but they couldn't find the house, the trail, or even the parking lot, even with the directions we had followed. With no evidence and no motive for me to have hurt Jake, the police eventually backed off. I was certain I had lost my mind by that point, and the guilt of leaving my friend behind had been eating away at me. I spent a long time locked up in my apartment before I finally went through my bag from that day. It wasn't until I pulled it out of my bag that I remembered Jake had given me his notebook, just in case. The book was filled with notes on the trails I'd hiked with Jake. He had collected information on strange events and missing person cases for every trail we had hiked. I flipped through the pages and found the entry on the final trail we'd hiked together. Jake originally learned about the place from an online forum dedicated to the paranormal and unexplained. A user posted it asking if anyone could tell them more about the holding house. Jake had copied down the reply of a user named In the Woods, the T replaced with the number 7. The Holding House lies deep within the forest. Its name is pretty straightforward. It is called the Holding House because it holds on to those unfortunate enough to wander inside. It isn't easy to find, but you wouldn't want to go there anyway. At the trail entrance leading to the house, you will find some signs of victims that have come before. It is the house's way to lure in the curious. If you are foolish enough to follow the trail, you'll come across several more signs before the house eventually appears somewhere far off the trail. 
I have yet to hear of anyone that has gone farther than that and made it back to share the details. But the story goes that if you bring all the signs the house left and head inside, it's possible to trade places with those holds. A group of four can enter the house to trade places with another group of four. If you don't follow the rules, though, you will become another part of its collection, the latest victim of the holding house. Below the forum's user's reply was a memo. In the woods, the cast iron bar, Friday, 9.30, along with the same rhyme Jake had told me in the woods. Holding on to those below, new things help with letting go. I flipped through the last few pages and almost missed the Polaroid glued to the inside of the back cover. On the bottom of the photo were two names, Emma and Jake, and below it, Jake had written, Never Forget. Depicted in the photo was Jake, looking much younger, with a smile on his face and an arm around a girl I recognized immediately. She had long, red hair, and I'd seen a photo of her in the woods the day I left Jake behind. I hope you enjoyed Photos in the Woods, as written by Katarib and performed by Creepyface and Eric Peabody. Creepyface's performance can be found right here on our very own network, as well as on his YouTube channel, called by the same name. He has worked so very hard, making a career out of voice acting and his love of horror, and with his talent, we just had to have him on our team. I implore you to please check him out. Help us welcome our newest chilling family member. Now. Our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close, but before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight, and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Nick Goroff, standing in for our dear friend Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>